should be able to see my screen now. That's kind of good. Yeah, we can see it. Great, thank you. All right, today is October 4th, and we're supposed to be working on chapter two. And it looks like we're supposed to finish chapter two today. Uh, please note that we're having our first quiz on Wednesday of this week. It'll cover chapters one and 10. The start of chapter two, so only what we started in chapter two, it's not gonna cover anything we're covering today. I don't think I even covered everything on uh, Thursday. And it also cover labs zero, one, and two. Any question about the quiz or what we're doing today? All right, if there's no questions, let's move on. So we had talked about uh, the biological molecules and we finished with carbohydrates and I think proteins. So we had talked just an introduction about lipids and said that they consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but they have very little oxygen and generally they're nonpolar and insoluble in water, although there is one exception. And we mentioned that lipids can be broken down into simple lipids, complex lipids, and steroids. Uh, a fatty acid is a major component of lipids, especially simple lipids. They consist of chains of carbons, and it's a fairly long, chain of actually hydrocarbons, carbon and hydrogen. So there's a fatty acid. It does have a little bit of oxygen uh, right here. And then right here, of course, this part comes off when the fatty acid is linked with another, well, with the lipid, we'll just word it that way. We'll talk about how fatty acids link to make lipids or link to make complex lipids, I guess you'd call it, fats. So they do have a carboxyl group, the COOH right here at one end. Most other locations for the fatty acid have a hydrogen atom. There's two types of uh, fatty acids, which makes two types of fats as well. And that is there's a saturated fatty acid and that is where every hydrogen that can be bound can is bound, meaning that, that other than the carbon-carbon bond, uh, there's a hydrogen link to it. And then the other uh, fatty acid is an unsaturated fatty acid, and that has one double carbon bond where two of the carbons are linked with a covalent, two double covalent bonds. And that means that they will have one less hydrogen bound to the carbon because the carbon is binding to itself in a double covalent bond. Wherever you have the, uh, the double covalent carbon bond, which is where the unsaturated fatty acid is unsaturated, this causes a kink in the chain. Instead of being a straight carbon chain making the fatty acid, there will be a kink where there's the double bond. And I'll show you a picture of that. Blow this up. So there, you can kind of see. Let me blow that up a little more. There's the double carbon bond making this a unsaturated fatty acid. And where there's the double carbon bond, there's a kink in the chain. It's no longer a straight fatty acid, which is this case up here. Any care questions about any of that? Uh, you can find 
unsaturated fatty acids and oil, such as corn oil. The uh, fatty acids get together with glycerol to make fats or triglycerides. So let me blow that up a little bit. Uh, here we have a glycerol molecule and it can get together with three fatty acid chains and they bind right here where OH comes off of the fatty acid and a hydrogen comes off of the glycerol. And if you put three fatty acids on a glycerol, we then have this molecule here, which is called the triglyceride, tri for these three fatty acids. However, a simpler name for that is a fat, three fatty acids and a glycerol. And if you wanna see some fat, just look down at your belly. Everybody has at least a layer of fat under the skin in their belly. Uh, fat is the body's richest energy source. So if you wanted to get as much energy as you could from what you're eating, you would want to eat fat. For example, if you're, I don't know, if your car breaks down and is it Nome, Alaska in the middle of the wintertime and you got to hike 20 miles into town and the best thing to carry for energy would be fat. It's not necessarily the best thing to eat. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that gram for gram, you'll get more energy out of fat than you will out of any other food. And then fat or, or triglycerides are stored as adipose in animals. Any question about any of that? All right, this is an unsaturated fat because it has one double carbon bond. That's all you need to make this chain from a saturated fat to an unsaturated fat. Any question about any of that? All right. Uh, let me come up here and state that you make the uh, triglycerides by binding the fatty acid to the glycerol. And that happens by dehydration synthesis. And we've talked about dehydration synthesis earlier. Now, when we're talking about fats, generally they are nonpolar and hydrophobic, meaning they don't dissolve in water. They, quote, are afraid of water, uh, meaning they just don't dissolve in water and they'll separate from water. There is one exception, and that is a phospholipid. It's a very special lipid in that, well, number one, it can dissolve in water and it can dissolve in fats or oil. It's also special because it has two fatty acid tails and then the glycerol molecule, let me blow that up. The glycerol is right here. But in the third position of the glycerol, we don't have a fatty acid tail we have a phosphate group bound to it. And it's this phosphate group which makes the phospholipid, um, well, this phosphate is actually polar and uh, it uh, allows phospholipids to dissolve in water. Now we don't call a phospholipid totally nonpolar or totally polar because it's both. This region of the fatty, uh, the uh, phospholipid with the fatty acid portion is nonpolar. And this region will dissolve in oil or fats. 
and then this region is polar and it dissolves in water. This makes this molecule biphasic so that it can dissolve in both water and oil. Biphasic molecules are not very common. You do know of one though, and detergents are biphasic. And that's why a detergent helps us clean our clothes. One region of the molecule of detergents will dissolve in water. The other region will dissolve in oil. And that is why detergents help us clean our clothes because the water will dissolve the water soluble molecule and then the detergent will dissolve the oil soluble molecules from our clothes. Any question about any of that? All right. So when we look at a phospholipid, we can draw it, I don't know, briefly like this, where this is the head, these are the tails, the head is polar, the tails are nonpolar. And then when we put phospholipid molecules all together in water, they start lining up like this. And the reason why they line up like this is that uh, the nonpolar tails of the phospholipid like to be together around other nonpolar molecules, and they don't like to be around the water on this side and that side. And when we uh, put phospholipids in water, they'll actually start forming this, and then they'll form this or this, and we look at this, what does this look like? What's that look like? Come on, somebody's got a guess. This should look very familiar to you. What has a lipid bilayer? With a cell membrane side and water on the outside, the phospholipids coming together, the uh, not the phospholipids, the fatty acids coming together to be away from the water. All right, the cell membrane is a bilayer that is mainly composed of phospholipid molecules. And this looks like a cell with the cytoplasm inside, which is mostly water. And then if we're thinking like a blood cell, the blood is mostly water on the outside of the cell. And even if you're talking about, I don't know, like a muscle cell, uh, the muscle is mostly water. So on the outside of the cell is mostly water. Any question about any of that? So phospholipids actually get together in water to form this. And that's sort of how the cell membrane were to form if the cell were to make the membrane. Uh, I do need to point out something, and we're not really going to talk about this, but uh, for uh, uh, um, molecules like the archaea, which live in extreme environments like very hot temperature or a very cold temperature, you might not have this type of a structure to the cell membrane, but maybe more like that. And then when we're talking about animal cells, animal cells don't have a cell wall. So they have cholesterol inserted in the cell membrane and the cholesterol helps give strength to the cell membrane. Any question about any of that? And cholesterol we'll talk about in a little bit is a lipid. So this is all lipids making the cell membrane. All right, any question about phospholipids? The main molecule of a cell membrane, and they just get together like this to make the cell membrane. 
All right. If there's no questions about phospholipids, let's move on to steroids and sterols. A steroid is four interconnected rigid carbon rings stuck together. That is a lipid. Uh, the steroid is unusual, sort of, and that this lipid does not have a monomer. When we're talking about both the uh, phospholipids and the fats, we do have monomers, and that's the fatty acid and the glycerol. And for the fat, uh, phos for the phospholipid, the monomers are fatty acids, glycerol, and then the phosphate group. But with a steroid as well as a sterol, we don't have a monomer. There's only one, I don't know, one molecule, we'll word it that way. And this is one important steroid, actually sterol in our body, cholesterol, which is one of the common steroids in the body. If there's an OH group attached to the steroid, it's called a sterol, and cholesterol is a sterol. Any question about any of that? You find cholesterol only in animal products. So animals make cholesterol. If ever you're eating plant-based food, doesn't matter if it's protein, carbohydrates, or lipids, plants do not have cholesterol. So you only get cholesterol when you eat animal products. Any question about any of that? All right, are there any question about lipids? One of the four biological molecules. If not, let's move on to proteins. Proteins are essential in cell structure and function. Proteins may be structural proteins found in bone, muscle, or hair. Proteins may be enzymes which speed up chemical reactions. Proteins may be transport proteins, such as the transport protein in the cell membrane, which moves molecules across the cell membrane. Proteins may be regulatory proteins that help regulate body functions, like for example, a hormone, such as a growth hormone in a child, making the child grow. Uh, proteins are responsible for movement. The reason why my arm is moving or why we're capable of walking is because of proteins contracting in our muscles, causing the muscle to move. Another one for a uh, microorganism is, is that microorganisms move because of protein. And we mentioned that bacteria have a flagella if they swim, and that flagella is made of a protein. Any question about that? There are also proteins that are responsible for some bacterial toxins. The toxin is a substance which is poisonous to us. And some of the bacterial proteins are actually toxins. And then there are proteins which we call antibodies. And these are proteins which we make or an animal makes to help defend them against a bacterial infection or help defend the body. We'll just word it that way. So as you can see, proteins have a large number of functions. And they are more diverse than any of the other biological molecules. Why are they more diverse than any of the other biological molecule? Because proteins have more monomers than any of the other biological molecules. For carbohydrates, there's a handful of monomers that can make 
I don't know, like a complex carbohydrate like starch. And it's uh, uh, this, uh, simple uh, sugars like uh, fructose and glucose and beta-galactose. Like I said, there's a handful of, of sugars which make up carbohydrates. There's also a handful of fatty acids that make up lipids. We haven't talked about nucleic acids yet, but uh, there's only four uh, monomers for nucleic acids. Like there's four uh, different nucleotides that make up DNA. And then there's four that make up RNA and three of them are the same. So you could say maybe there's five total nucleotides. But with proteins, in humans, we have 20 different monomers. Proteins are made up of amino acids, and we have 20 different monomers. Now, when we look at uh, different life forms, most of them have about 20 different monomers making up proteins, meaning 20 different amino acids. Uh, they may not be the same amino acids, but if the species doesn't have an amino acid we have, they will have another amino acid, but they throw out an amino acid we have so that all species have close to 20 amino acids. I think the highest is something like 23 amino acids. You don't need to know the highest. Most species have about 20 amino acids, the same as humans. Any question about any of that? All right, so proteins are made up of monomers that are called amino acids, and they're just subunits. And we have many of these repeating to make up the protein. All amino acids have this generalized formula. They have a central carbon and then a hydrogen attached to that central carbon. On one end of this carbon, we have the amino group, which is either NH2 or NH3. And then we have the carboxyl group on the other end, which can be COOH or COO with a negative charge. Uh, amino acids also have an R group. R can stand for essentially anything. It's just an abbreviation. And this R group changes depending on what amino acid we're talking about. For example, the amino acid tyrosine has this R group here. You don't need to know the different R groups, but I'm showing them here. The simplest R group is the amino acid glycine where the R group is just a hydrogen. The R groups can be nonpolar, such as this, this, that, and that. Or the R group can be at least partially polar. Like this OH group makes this part of the molecule polar. It is true that uh, this part of the chain of the R group is nonpolar. Uh, this NH and that NH are polar. The rest of the molecule, like this right here, right there, and this part here is nonpolar. That means that proteins are composed of amino acids, which some of them are nonpolar. So this R group is nonpolar. These R groups are all nonpolar. And then some of them can be polar or have polar regions like this one and these two here. And all amino acids are actually polar because the amino group and the carboxyl group are polar. So all amino acids have polar regions and some amino acids have an R group, which is nonpolar, making proteins both polar and nonpolar. Any question about any of that? When you have a protein, 
which is in water, you have the molecule take on the protein shape. Can you guys see my hands? Anybody? Yes. yes. Okay, great. The protein will take on the shape and the molecule will fold such that the nonpolar regions will go inside the protein. Okay, so I'm making the protein here. These will be the nonpolar regions of the protein. They'll go inside the molecule if the protein is in water, dissolved in water. However, if the protein is dissolved in a lipid, like a protein in the cell membrane, then the nonpolar regions will stay on the outside. I can't really do that. And then the polar regions will fold and be on the inside of the molecule. Any question about any of that? And it's just the folding pattern of the proteins. All right, uh, amino acids get together to make a protein. And when you have two amino acids come together, let me blow that up a little bit. Uh, OH comes off of one amino acid, the carboxyl side, and H comes off the uh, amino side. That forms water. And then this nitrogen here will bind directly to uh, this carbon here. And that uh, happens in dehydration synthesis, forming two amino acids linked together, a dipeptide. This bond between the nitrogen of one amino acid and the car carbon of another amino acid is a rare bond. It is rare not only in biological molecules, it is rare in the universe. We call this bond a peptide bond because we do see this bond in peptides or proteins, but it's not a very common bond, even in the universe. Any questions about that? And then you just link more of the amino acids together to get a polypeptide chain. When the last amino acid joins to the polypeptide chain, that is when we call it a protein. Before the protein is finalized, meaning before you add the last amino acid, you can't call it a protein. You could call it a growing protein, but it's not a complete protein until the last amino acid is added. And so before that time, you should call it a polypeptide. A polypeptide is just many amino acids linked together. A peptide is two or more amino acids linked together. Any question about any of that? All right. When we're talking about proteins, and remember proteins get made by amino acids linking together, and they just line up one after the other like a beads on a string. And when you add the last bead, the last amino acid, that's when you have a protein. When we're talking about proteins, Proteins have four levels of structure. The primary level, actually, let me go ahead and open this because this will take a while. Uh, in PowerPoint, you can't open a link now from PowerPoint, not directly. And so I'm going to put it right here. And this will take a minute to to load, so that's why I want to do that. Uh, the four levels of protein structure, the primary level, the secondary level, the tertiary level, and the quaternary level. 
So let's talk about each of these four levels of protein structure. And aren't we lucky? We're getting two commercials before we get to see the... Uh, this doesn't look right. A good chunk of your time is actually spent writing emails. If you don't know what Grammarly is, it's basically a digital writing assistant. And it we got three commercials at time. In this video, we're going to talk about the structure of proteins. And what basically is a protein? A protein is a polymer consistent of many amino acids. So each amino acid represented by the circle is a monomer that forms the protein. Whenever you have many amino acids, it's also called a polypeptide. And the bond that connects each individual amino acid residue is a peptide bond. So let's talk about the individual structure of an amino acid. So an amino acid has a chiral carbon with a hydrogen attached to it, and it has an amine group attached to it as well. And then it has an R group and a carboxyl group. Now I'm going to draw another amino acid right next to it. The left side where the nitrogen is located is the N terminal of the amino acid. The right side that has the carboxyl group is the C terminal of the amino acid. Now these two amino acids can react with each other in a condensation reaction where we're going to lose water. And we're going to connect the two amino acids into one molecule. So once water is removed, we could form a peptide bond. This is also called a dehydration reaction because you're losing water. And so this is going to be the new product of the reaction. So let's see if I can fit it in here. So this oxygen is gone. So now we have a nitrogen. Let me take out H2O. We have one hydrogen left over. We lost two once we lost water. So this is a dipeptide because we have two amino acids combined. And so this amide bond that we see here, that is the peptide bond. We formed a bond between the carbon and the nitrogen atom. So whenever you combine two amino acids to form a peptide bond, you're forming a covalent bond, which is hard to break. Now let's talk about the different levels of protein structure. There's four levels that you need to know. The primary structure, the secondary structure, the tertiary structure, and finally the quaternary structure. Now the primary structure is simply based on the sequence of the amino acids found in the protein. The sequence determines the shape of the protein. If you replace just one amino acid with another, it will completely change the shape of the protein. So the shape and its function is primarily determined by the sequence of amino acids. The secondary structure describes the localized shape of a protein. And there's two of them that you need to be familiar with, the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. In the alpha helix, you could see that it's stabilized by hydrogen bonds. The NH group of one amino acid interacts with the carbonyl group of another amino acid. And each turn contains about 3.6 amino acid residues. Now here is a visual illustration of the beta pleated sheet. Just like the alpha helix, it too is stabilized by hydrogen bonds between the carbonyl group of one amino acid and the NH group of another amino acid. Next up, we have the tertiary structure, which represents the three-dimensional complete folding pattern of the protein. 
And so here's the visual illustration of it. So we could see some areas is just a straight chain. Here we have an alpha helix, and here we have a beta pleated sheet. Now, the tertiary structure is one individual subunit. When you combine multiple subunits, you create a quaternary structure. So hemoglobin is an example of that. It has four individual subunits, two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. So hemoglobin is a protein with a quaternary structure. And so that's basically it for this video. Hopefully it gave you a basic understanding of proteins and the four levels of structure that they have. Thanks for watching. All right, any questions about that? No questions? All right, let's talk about each of the different levels of protein structure. The primary structure is just the specific sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. So you link up the amino acids, one after the other, make the primary structure, meaning you've got the orange one followed by the blue amino acid, followed by the yellow one, followed by two pink amino acids, but just the sequence. Once the protein is made, these, uh, that we have the primary structure of the protein. Once that is made, the neighboring amino acids can start interacting with each other. And your textbook may have this slightly wrong. And that is, I think your textbook in some web pages also say that the interaction is hydrogen bonds form between some of the amino acids, okay? It's more than just hydrogen bonds. That is one interaction that happens between nearby amino acids. Other interactions that happen between nearby amino acids are there can be repulsion between amino acids. This could be a polar amino acid, and this would be a nonpolar. These guys would then repulse each other because polar and nonpolar don't like being together. Okay, these would both be polar because they're forming a hydrogen bond between them. Another interaction that you could have, which isn't shown here, maybe we'll put it this one and that one. This could be uh, nonpolar and nonpolar. And then this would be an attraction because two nonpolar amino acids want to come together. We're not gonna talk much about that interaction, but those are van der Waal forces where nonpolar molecules like being together. An example of van der Waal forces interacting and causing the substance to take on properties is if, with, if you put a whole bunch of liquid oil, like corn oil molecules in a bottle, the corn oil will come together forming a liquid. And the reason why it's a liquid is because the van der Waal forces make the molecules attracted to each other, forming the liquid. Any questions about any of that? Okay. Uh, anyways, you can have in a protein uh, nonpolar and nonpolar being attracted to each other. Uh, we didn't talk much about the repulsion other than polar and nonpolar. You could also have an ionic repulsion where this amino acid has a positive charge and that amino acid has a positive charge. That would mean these two amino acids would be repulsed from each other. It's positive charge will be repulsed from a positive charge. And then again, where would be an example? Um, maybe right here and here. Uh, these two could be ionic positive charge, ionic negative charge, and then these two amino acids would be attracted to each other. Now, I think I stated all the different retract, uh, attractions and repulsions, but let me check. Hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, and ionic bond interactions. 
So you can have all of these interactions happening in the secondary structure of the protein. What's specific about the secondary structure is all of the interactions between the amino acids are by or between neighboring amino acids. You never have an interaction between non-neighbors, like an amino acid at the start of the protein and near the end of the protein. Those wouldn't be neighbors. So in a secondary structure, all of the interactions between amino acids are between neighboring amino acids. And the book talks about this. I don't really uh, talk much about this, so you don't really need to know it. I won't quiz you on it. You can have three different types of secondary structure. You can have a uh, helix where the uh, structure coils on itself, taking on a helical structure. You can have the beta pleated sheet where the interactions make the um, hydrogen bonds between the protein. Let me see where I can find the proteins, right here and right here, uh, where there's lots of interactions making the protein take on a sheet type of appearance. The third one, which isn't shown here, is you can have a random coil of the protein where it is connected or bind by like hydrogen bonds or ionic bonds in a certain region. And then other regions are not connected, maybe repulsed, a random coil. Any question about the secondary structure? If not, then we can have the tertiary structure of a protein. In the tertiary structure, we have the amino acids interacting with each other. However, the interactions can be between any of the amino acids in the protein, such as here, where this amino acid near the end of the protein is being attracted, interacting with this amino acid over here, which is near the beginning of the protein. Hopefully I said that was the end and this is the beginning of the protein. You get the same interactions in the tertiary structure as you have in the secondary structure. Many you can have hydrogen bonds, you can have ionic bonds, you can have ionic repulsions, you can have nonpolar and polar repulsions, you can have non polar attractions. I think that's all of it. I might have missed one. You can have all of that. And in the tertiary structure, you have one other attraction that you do not have in the secondary structure. And that is in the tertiary structure, you can have a disulfide bridge between the two amino acid cysteine. So this cysteine here and this cysteine here. Let's see if I can draw that. Can connect. So we're just going to have the uh, protein here, and we're going to have cysteine, which has a sulfhydro group. Oops. And then we have a sulfhydro group here on another cysteine. Well, oops, I should draw that H on the other side. The H's can come off. Ah. So the H's come off, and then we form a link between the sulfur, two sulfurs. And that we call a sulfur dye bridge. Disulfide bridge, sorry. It's two uh, sulfurs come together, disulfide two, and then they call it a bridge. This is a very strong 
interaction between this amino acid and that amino acid, because this link is a covalent chemical bond. Any question about any of that? Uh, how strong is this link? When you get your hair permed, you're making disulfide bridges in your hair, making your hair get the perm. And as you know, if you've ever had a perm, you can go into the shower and the perm will stay. It'll last for about a month with routine showering. Uh, my mother used to curl her hair, which I don't think it happens very much. She would uh, curl up her hair in a bobby pin, stick the bobby pin, and then put the curling uh, hat on, turn on the curling machine. I think it would put steam in her hair. And then she would, after, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes, take it down and take out the bobby pin and her hair would have this nice curl in it. Of course, she lived in Western Oregon. And then when she'd go out in the, the mist of Western Oregon, the mist would make that curl sag. Meaning that uh, just a little bit of mist in the air would break the hydrogen bond, which was formed from her curling the hair. Meaning the hydrogen bond is a very weak interaction between the uh, amino acids of the hair, whereas the disulfide bridge is a very strong interaction. Any question about any of that? How many of you have had your hair permed? I did had? when I was eight. Yeah, you, you know what I'm talking about. That perm is very strong and it lasts a long time. That smell never goes away. Oh, does it smell? I didn't know that. I've never had my hair perm. Is that the treatment to make the perm? It, yes, it stinks. Oh. All right. So we have all of these interactions in the tertiary structure. And the interactions happen between amino acids that are not neighbors on the protein. Now, some proteins, all they ever get to is a tertiary structure because if the protein only has one polypeptide subunit, the highest level of a protein structure they can get is a tertiary structure. For example, all the enzymes that I know of, like catalase and coagulase. Uh, the highest structure they can get is a tertiary structure because these proteins only have one polypeptide subunit. If you have a protein that has more than one polypeptide making up the protein, then you can have the protein have a quaternary structure. Quaternary structure is where the polypeptides come together and then start interacting, forming the interactions you see in the tertiary structure between the uh, different polypeptides to make the final protein. Some examples of proteins that have a quaternary structure are hemoglobin and antibodies, which are both made up of four polypeptide subunits. And then another one would be insulin. In the tertiary structure, the protein takes on its correct folding pattern so that the protein will have its optimal function, at least in its optimal environment. And the same happened in the quaternary structure where the different uh, polypeptide units come together, and then they take on the correct fold of the protein. Only some proteins have a quaternary structure. 
And like I said, they have to have more than one polypeptide subunit. Any question about the four levels of protein structure? If not, let's talk about proteins. There are two types of proteins. Globular, those are roughly spherical proteins, like hemoglobin, most enzymes are globular. And then fibrous proteins, thread-like. And these are structural proteins like collagen. Proteins can form combinations with other molecules, and we call these conjugated proteins, where the amino acid portion of the protein gets together with another component. We name the molecule by the non-protein component, like glycoproteins are protein and a glyc glycogen, meaning a carbohydrate, and then lip lipoproteins are lipids and proteins connected together. You can find lipoproteins and glycoproteins on both the cell membrane as well as in the blood. Proteins have to have their correct shape in order to function at their optimal rate. If they do not have their correct shape, we say the protein is denaturing, or if it's fully denatured, it's denatured. And a denatured protein is one where the protein loses its three-dimensional shape, where it can break hydrogen bonds, will form hydrogen bonds that shouldn't be there. The protein that is denatured is no longer functional. You can denature a protein by putting at the incorrect temperature, the incorrect pH, or the incorrect salt concentration. Any questions about proteins and protein denaturation? I think we'll come back to talking about protein denaturation in a later uh, lesson. But the point is, the protein, when it's folded, unfolds and then takes on a different shape. And it doesn't work as well, or if it's completely denatured, it won't work at all. All right, let's talk about the last of the biological molecule, nucleic acids. There are two nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. DNA is called deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA ribonucleic acid. They have a few differences. One of them is uh, the sugar in DNA is deoxyribose and in RNA it is ribose. A nucleic acid consists of monomers that we call nucleotides. So here is a nucleotide, and a nucleotide has three parts to it. It has a pentose sugar, five carbon sugar, that's my main by pentose. It has a, a phosphate group attached to it, and it has a nitrogen containing base attached to it. There are four nucleotides in DNA and four nucleotides in RNA. Two are purines and two are pyrimidines. Let me see. The nucleotide is the monomer. The purines are adenine or guanine, and you can abbreviate that with A or G. So if you don't want to remember adenine and guanine, you can go A and G. Anyways, those are the purines. And for DNA, the pyrimidines are cytosine or C and thymine or T. An easy way to distinguish the purines from the pyrimidines is pyrimidine has a Y in it and cytosine and thymine have a Y in them. 
any question about any of that? There's just a mnemonic device you can remember. What are the pyrimidines? And they have a Y in them. The purines do not. Now, in uh, DNA, we have A, G, C, and T. In RNA, we have A, G, C. We do not have T. T is replaced with uracil or U. And if you remember that uracil replaces th t, t, thymine, thymine has a Y in it, so it is a pyrimidine. Uracil replaces thymine, so uracil is also pyrimidine. Generally, I would only ask what are the pyrimidines in DNA, but for RNA, you don't have thymine, you have uracil. For DNA, the bases bind to each other by hydrogen bonding. A always pairs with T because A binds with T by hydrogen bonding. And C in DNA always pairs with G because C binds with G. And here we're looking at the hydrogen bonding between A and T. You can note there's two hydrogen bonds between A and T. And I don't think I have it shown with G and C, but let me come down here. There's three hydrogen bonds between G and C. Any question about any of that? All right, RNA is a single strand molecule. So most of the time it's not pairing. The exception would be when the RNA is made, it's being made from DNA, in which case it is pairing with the DNA. But most of the time RNA is single stranded, so it's not pairing. But DNA, most of the time is double stranded. And so the DNA pairs with one strand with another. And uh, the A pairs with T from one strand to the other, and the C pairs with G. Any questions about any of that? So DNA has the sugar deoxyribose. It's double stranded. It's held together by the sugar phosphate backbone, meaning one strand of DNA is held together by the sugar and then the phosphate, followed by the sugar and then the phosphate. And that is a, uh, a covalent chemical bond holding the single strand of DNA together. The second strand of DNA is only held to the first strand of DNA by hydrogen bonds between the C and the G pair and the T and the A pair. DNA actually, uh, oops, didn't mean to do that. DNA uh, actually forms a helix where it uh, twists sort of like a spiral staircase. And the bases are the step on the spiral staircase, meaning the sugar and the phosphate is holding a single strand of DNA together. The bases are off on the side and we can call them the steps of the spiral staircase. Any question about any of that? So the double-stranded DNA is held together only by hydrogen bonds. This hydrogen bond right there can break and reform, and actually it does break and reform all the time. And that's true for any of the hydrogen bonds. So when this bond breaks, why is the DNA staying together as a double helix? Come on, somebody's got a guess. All right, think about that. What's holding the DNA together when this a hydrogen bond breaks. Think about that. And uh, when you get an answer, you can just say, I, I've got the answer. 
Okay. All right. What else do I need to say about this? Oh, um, hmm. I guess we'll talk about that later. Actually, it is shown here, but just not very clear. Let me blow this up. The DNA, one strand is running one way, the other strand is running the opposite way. And this is the five prime end of the molecule. The uh, number is just the carbon position in uh, ribose. You don't need to know that, but uh, this is the five prime end. And the point is this one is running this way and that one is running the opposite way, meaning this is the three prime end, the five prime end, oops, dang it, where did I lose that? Let me blow this up another way. There we go. So, oops, it's not even shown here. Yep. The three prime end is on this side of that molecule. And on this one, the five prime end is down here. And this is the five prime end on this one here. This would be the three prime end. Any questions about any of that? All right, uh, RNA has the sugar ribose. RNA is single stranded, at least in our cells. Um, once again, the RNA is held together by the sugar phosphate backbone. The bases are off on the side and we've mentioned that there's four bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. There are three major kinds of RNA, transfer RNA or tRNA, messenger RNA or messenger RNA or mRNA, and ribosomal RNA and rRNA. When the RNA molecule is being made, what's the difference between tRNA, messenger RNA, and rRNA? Is there any difference in the, uh, the ribose? Is there any difference in the nucleotides or the parts of the nucleotides, like the phosphate, the ribose, uracil? Any guess? All right, well, think about that. What's the difference between tRNA messenger RNA and rRNA. And if nobody's gonna give a guess, I'll make sure you have a quiz question on that. Doesn't the RNA make the proteins, like it helps connect like the amino acids together? Uh, it's true that you need tRNA, messenger RNA and ribosomal RNA to make the protein. Meaning the code is, we'll talk about this later, is held on the messenger RNA, and you need all three of them to make the, the protein. But how are tRNA, messenger RNA, and rRNA different from each other that we call one tRNA, one messenger RNA, and one rRNA? Well, here's another question. This one I don't expect you guys to get. And that is when the DNA is making RNA, how does the DNA know what type of RNA to make? How does it know to make tRNA instead of messenger RNA or rRNA? Well, this one I will tell you. Does it you. have something to do with uh, Go ahead. Question. Does it have something to do with 
the location where the of the cell or as far as i don't know if that makes sense uh it kind of makes sense but no it has nothing to do with the location of the cell it has to do with the gene there are some genes that make trna and there are trna gene there are some cells which make rrna and they're an r RNA gene, and most of the genes make messenger RNA. Okay, so it depends on the gene. Depending on what the gene is, it'll make one type of RNA, and it simply will uh, make the correct RNA because of the sequence of the nucleotides in the gene will tell it to make tRNA, assuming the gene is a tRNA gene. Okay. And that actually is close to the answer for what's the difference between tRNA and messenger RNA and rRNA. So think about that. And I'll give you a hint. There's no difference in the ribose of tRNA, messenger RNA, no difference in the phosphate, no difference in the bases. There's no difference in the nucleotides. You have the same four is nucleotides it, for tRNA, messenger is RNA. Is it different and amino RNA. acids? Say again. Is it different amino acids? Um, there are no amino acids in rRNA. I mean, in RNA. So I'm not sure what you're getting at. Uh, RNA doesn't have amino acids. They have nucleotides. Sorry, nucleotides. I meant nucleotides, I guess. It's the sequence of nucleotides that determine whether the molecule is a tRNA, a messenger RNA, or an rRNA. You have a certain sequence for tRNA, and it's true there's more than one sequence because there's, let me see, there's about 20 different tRNAs. It might be a little less than 20, but something like that. And then for rRNA, there's about a half a dozen sequences for making an rRNA. And then for messenger RNA, there's many different sequences for the RNA to be, could be a messenger RNA. It's just the sequence of the nucleotides that determines, determines which it is. Any question about any of that? All right. Uh, I do need to mention just a little bit about ATP when I'm talking about nucleic acids. ATP is uh, adenosine triphosphate, and it is under the umbrella of nucleic acid molecules. ATP is important to the cell because when the cell needs an energy source, it tends to get its energy from ATP, regardless of what the cell is going to spend the energy on, ATP is most of the time the energy source. ATP has ribose, has the sugar, adenine as the base, and then it has three phosphates, why it's called triphosphate. When you have three phosphates together, the third phosphate is linked with a high energy bond. And actually the second phosphate is also linked with a high energy bond. Whenever the cell needs energy, it can break off this third phosphate group, releasing the energy in this high phosphate energy bond. And that releases a lot of energy. If the cell needs more energy than you can get from separating one phosphate group from ATP, the cell could separate the second phosphate group. And this would be from ATP or ADP, depending on what you're, you're talking about. You're talking about the starting molecules ATP. Any question about any of that? So when the cell needs energy, it frequently will break this bond right here in ATP. And if it needs even more energy, it can break this bond as well. 
So ATP is made by dehydration synthesis. What you do is you take ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and you get it together with an inorganic phosphate molecule. And then you can make ATP, but this takes energy to make ATP. Uh, if you remember from uh, Biology 160, uh, this is an endergonic reaction. You need to take uh, energy uh, to form this reaction going this way. ADP plus phosphate and energy yields ATP and water. Now, when the uh, cell wants to gain energy from ATP, it can combine water with ATP. And this is an exergonic reaction. It releases energy, making ADP and releasing a phosphate and energy. Any question about any of that? All right. So this is an important reaction. We'll talk a little bit more about it, but whenever the cell needs energy, it tends to get its energy from ATP. Any question about any of that? All right. Let's just briefly talk about hydrogen bonds. What molecules did we discuss today, as well as in previous lesson, that have hydrogen bonds? And these hydrogen bonds give the molecule important properties. Um, nucleic acids have hydrogen bonds to connect them for DNA. Yeah, in DNA, we have hydrogen bonds linking the two strands together. You wouldn't have double-stranded DNA without the hydrogen bonds. What's another molecule that has hydrogen bonds, giving the molecule important properties. Isn't it like making the protein the structure? Yes, the second amino structure. acids in the uh, protein can form hydrogen bonds, which help give the protein the correct three-dimensional structure. So those are just two. In reality, you have hydrogen bonds between uh, carbohydrates too. That's why sugar will dissolve in water. We talked about water last time. Water has hydrogen bonds that give water important properties. Um, lipids do not tend to form hydrogen bonds except for the phospholipid. And we already talked about proteins and nucleic acids. So good job. Uh, what would happen to these molecules if the hydrogen bonds were to suddenly disappear from all of them? What would happen to the molecules? What would happen to DNA if it all the hydrogen its, bonds were to disappear? It would lose its structure. Yeah, it would lose its structure. You no longer have double-stranded DNA. What would happen to a protein if you lost all the hydrogen bonds? Wouldn't it denature? Yeah, the protein would take on a different shape and denature. Probably would not be functional after losing all its hydrogen bonds. Okay, any questions about any of this lesson? All right, uh, I think uh, we will stop here and I'll see you at 6.30 for lab three. Don't forget you have to take the quiz one uh, by Wednesday. And remember you need to get Respondus Lockdown Browser if you have not done that. And you should do that soon because I've already had one student this term who had trouble with it, okay? All right. Uh, uh, if there's no questions, I'm going to log off.